Now it's on, is it not? Okay, perfect. So while all that activity is going on, I'm going to distract you over here um, and say good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2017 Charles Hastings Lecture on Public Health. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional people of this land, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat peoples, and specifically, the Mississaugas of New Credit First Nation. Toronto Public Health recognizes that Indigenous practices of health and well-being have been in place in this territory for over 10,000 years and are maintained to this day. We also recognize the special relationship Indigenous and non-Indigenous people have affirmed through treaties signed at a nation-to-nation -nation level. So, in case uh, there were pictures that kept scrolling there, but for those of you who didn't have a chance to see them, my name is Dr. Eileen Davila, and one month ago, I began as Toronto's Medical Officer of Health, and so it's my pleasure to be here today, and I'm actually quite excited about this evening, and to be here to open this year's lecture. So, as you may have guessed, I am new to Toronto Public Health, but as, it, but as it turns out, I'm not new to Toronto at all. Toronto is in fact the place I've called home for many years, and I'm not going to say exactly how many, but suffice it to say that it's been home for almost my whole life, and it is the place where I've chosen to raise my family. And what can I say, but it's a city of incredible diversity, incredible talent, and certainly strength. However, as great as we are, we face complex challenges. And these challenges call for bold and inspiring solutions. So the challenge that actually brings us together tonight is that of precarious housing and health. Our vision is to unlock opportunities for everyone, but especially for those locked out of full social participation. For me, equity and inclusion is the only way that we can build a healthier and truly more vibrant city. In the spirit of inclusion, I would like to thank Making Room Community Arts for their artistic contributions. The two original songs we just heard were first performed as part of a community art celebration on housing and health, which took place about a week ago in Parkdale. The celebration also included an exhibition which has been set up in the theater lobby, and if you haven't already done so, I would encourage you to explore it after the lecture. Making Room Community Arts is a local organization that brings diverse people together to create compelling art. The songs and exhibition reflect lived realities of housing issues in Toronto. It's a reminder that our work must be driven by the experiences and needs of people facing housing vulnerability. Tonight's lecture is supported by the generosity of our sponsors, so I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Evergreen City Works, Public Health Ontario, and the Centre for Urban Health Solutions at St. Michael's Hospital. Going on, while I'm pleased to see that there are so many of you who've chosen to gather here in person, I should let you know that the lecture is also being promoted through social media in real time. Due to interest from outside of Toronto, we are live streaming on Facebook, which I admit is a first for me, so I'm pretty excited about that. <laughs> Toronto Public Health will also be live tweeting from our social media table in the back. and. Um, According to my notes, I will be tweeting from my seat. <laughs> I'll be trying. Councillor Mahevic, I may need your help. I think you're an expert tweeter. <laughs> anyway, I welcome you to join me in tweeting or trying to tweet. Uh, perhaps we can set up a self-help group somewhere over here for those of us who are having challenges. For some of you, like myself, this is the first time you've been part of the Hastings Lecture. The lecture was inaugurated in 2008 to celebrate 125 years of public health in Toronto and to honour the legacy of Dr. Charles Hastings, Toronto's fourth medical officer of health, who served from 1910 
1929. I hope I can serve at least as long. <laughs> I'll look to Dr. Hastings as a role model. Dr. Hastings was a visionary leader who transformed the practice of public health. He introduced modern public health services and was an early champion of the social determinants of health, campaigning publicly for better living conditions for Toronto's most marginalized residents. I think it's most fitting to focus on housing and health this evening. And in 1911, in fact, Dr. Hastings released a seminal report on the slum conditions in Toronto. In this report, he zeroed in on inadequate and unsanitary housing conditions, calling these a menace to public health. Doctors ha Dr. Hastings' advocacy in these issues resulted in widespread housing reforms and stricter housing standards. And by 1922, under his leadership, Toronto had the lowest death rate of any large North American city, an amazing public health accomplishment. While Toronto made significant gains during Dr. Hastings' time, the issues of homelessness, housing insecurity, and substandard living conditions continue, unfortunately, today. Rising housing prices and rents are reported daily in the media, but we are dealing with more than just a housing bubble. For many years, community organizers, frontline staff, and people with lived experience have been talking about a housing crisis. Last week, the Ontario government introduced measures on housing affordability for home buyers and renters through the Fair Housing Plan. This plan outlines 16 comprehensive steps to help more people find an affordable place to call home while bringing stability to the real estate market and protecting the investment of homeowners. It's still too early to know how these measures will help but it is encouraging to see this plan and to recognize that all three levels of government have agreed that the status quo is no longer sustainable. Income disparities and growing and middle income neighborhoods are shrinking. More Toronto residents and neighborhoods are falling into poverty. Toronto's private rental and social housing stock is aging. Without proper investment, it is falling into stark disrepair. This year's lecture is centered on a recent Toronto Public Health report entitled Housing and Health, Unlocking Opportunity. What the report tells us is that housing affordability, quality and stability in Toronto is more than a social and economic problem. It's in fact a health equity issue. Unaffordable housing is associated with poorer overall health, lower nutrition and poorer dental care. The cost of housing for those with the lowest incomes tightens the crunch and creates unjust ultimatums. No one should be forced into these unacceptable circumstances. Lower income residents are often clustered in poorly resourced neighborhoods which tend to have the least access to employment opportunities, grocery stores, recreational facilities, green spaces, transportation, and the services required to maintain good health. When housing is unaffordable, the most marginalized in our city are pushed further into harm's way. Housing should never be a health hazard. Yet poor quality housing means exposure to physical, chemical, and biological risks. Overcrowding adds more injury to the mix and is associated with a range of negative health outcomes. Homeless people in Toronto face among the lowest rates of physical and mental health. The lifelong impact of homelessness on children cannot be understated. The earlier and the longer a child experiences homelessness, the greater the cumulative toll of negative health outcomes over the life course. When an interviewee from our housing report asked her children about what they will do in the future, they responded, What are you talking about, Mom? There is no future. 
I don't even know if we can live tomorrow. That's just unacceptable as far as I'm concerned. The distribution of housing vulnerability is no accident. People who already face the brunt of social and economic inequities also experience serious housing insecurity. These groups include Indigenous people, disabled people, seniors, members of the LGBTQ2S community, those affected by violence, and others. Adequate housing is a basic human need and vital for one's health. In fact, housing, in my opinion, is a basic human right. Taking action on housing is a matter of social justice, but it's also quite simply just plain common sense. While inadequate housing and homelessness are certainly detrimental to individuals, they also re result in tremendous losses to society whether you're talking about this financially, culturally, creatively, or civically. When people's health is compromised, they face barriers in reaching and contributing to their full potential. Addressing our current housing context requires a collaborative effort. No one sector or level of government can do this alone. We are indeed stronger together. By harmonizing our efforts, we can achieve the greatest good for the most people. So that's why we're fortunate to have Dr. Raphael Bostic as this year's keynote speaker. Dr. Bostic is the Judith and John Bedrosian Chair in Governance and Public Enterprise at the Saul Price School of Public Policy at the University of Southern California. Starting this June, Dr. Bostic will become the 15th President and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. He earned his PhD in economics from Stanford University and his BA from Harvard. I could go on and uh, continue to embarrass Dr. Bostic, who's sitting just down there in front of me, but you know, I'll let his words speak for themselves. I think you're going to find his talk to be quite informative and enlightening, and uh, I think you'll find great value um, in his discussion around taking health considerations into account when formulating housing and community development policy through a cross-sector health and all policies approach. So with that, I would ask you to please join me in welcoming Dr. Raphael Bostic to the 2017 Charles Hastings Lecture on Public Health. Good evening, everyone. It's really good to be here. It's a, it's a pleasure to be a part of this program. Uh, thank you, Dr. Davila, for a very kind introduction. And um, it's just a privilege to actually come to the stage after the choir to give us a, a feel of uh, the community and uh, sort of a more grounded, less academic feel for the evening. I think it's a good way to, to start a conversation. I wanted to also thank the sponsors for this and the organizers, in particular the Toronto Public Health Department, who reached out to me and asked me to participate in this program. Um, the intersection of housing and health care and health policy is something that uh, I've, over the last 10 years or so, spent a fair amount of time on. Um, it was not where I thought I would start, uh, but it has uh, definitely a, a, become a passion of mine. And I'm, I'm really uh, gratified that uh, the City of Toronto has uh, decided to devote uh, this year's Hastings Lecture to, to this topic. So when we talk about housing and health, uh, I wanted to just start with uh, some basics about what we know. So we know that when people are housed poorly, um, their physical health deteriorates and their mental health deteriorates. We know when people are housed poorly, um, they're more likely to experience food insecurity, 
uh, and not uh, use the healthcare system as much as they might otherwise. We know when people are housed poorly, our system housing costs go up because that health care uh, does not prevent conditions that, uh, that re ultimately require emergency services. We know when people are not housed well, they uh, will live in neighborhoods and under conditions that uh, endanger their safety. And they're more at risk of crime and of uh, the difficulties associated with day-to-day -day living. So if we know all of that, then why is my title called Unlocking Opportunity? This should be obvious. It should be fairly straightforward that uh, these two should go together. Uh, but unfortunately, the reality is that they don't. And uh, too often, actually, I think it's the, the more general state of play that the public health sector, the health sector, and the housing sector operate almost independent of each other. Uh, and their effects, uh, when they do complement, is kind of by accident. Uh, and for something as important as uh, people's health care, as well as their housing, I don't think it's a good idea for us to be doing policy by accident. So uh, what I want to do today is, is give you some perspectives on the intersection of housing and health. Um, talk about why we are in a place where we do not see the coordination and collaboration, and then highlight a number of efforts that are underway uh, that may provide some clues and guidance as to how we might do better moving forward. I want to say two things just to start. Uh, the first is that I'm going to rely on a lot of U.S. stuff. I'm from the U.S. That's what I'm going to do. Um, so just, you know, I'm a typical American talking about America all the time, right? <laughs> so, so I get that. Um, the second thing I want to say is um, that you know, through the course of today, I've had lots of conversations about this subject, and um, it's always a risk to, for me to pre prepare slides before I actually give the talk. So, so usually if it's in my class, I'm changing slides up to like two seconds before I walk into the classroom um, because I always change my mind about what I want to talk about. Um, I did the, I'm going to do that today. Um, so there are a bunch of slides that are in here that I don't want to talk about. I'm going to just <laughs> zip through them. Don't think you're missing anything. Well, you are missing something, but it's not anything central to what I want to do today. So I'm just going to give you that heads up when I go fast. It's because I changed my mind. Right? So that's a, that's a me issue. All right. So I want to talk about really four things. So first I want to do is just give you some background and some history about the intersection of housing and health. Um, then I want to talk about... Um, efforts that we've done in the U.S. to bring back the notion of housing in all policies. The idea that um, just about every policy has a health component to it uh, and that as you do your policies, you should recognize that and tailor it to try to maximize those health outcomes. Then I want to spend a fair amount of time talking about barriers to success and then close with, as I said, some of the efforts moving forward. The punchline is that um, this is hard. And it will actually require proactive strategizing and um, uh, building partnerships that allow us to uh, establish those collaborations, build programs that coordinate, and then ultimately start to see the changes in pu public health that I think are possible. And I do want to emphasize that last point. I do think that it is very possible to get improvements in public health if we can achieve the coordination and collaboration that, uh, that is out there, and the challenge now is just to, to get it done. All right, so first with the housing and health from a historical perspective. So as Dr. Davila noted, um, the, the discussions about housing and health, uh, health policy, start a long time ago, right? In Toronto, Dr. Hastings was talking about uh, the, the intersect, how, how poor housing was a threat to public health, and that we needed to do interventions to interact. So in the slides that were going before the program, uh, one of Hastings' quotes was up there. It says, it is homes we must give our people, not merely shelter. And I think that that is really a reflection of the idea that you know, a home is more than just the roof and the structure. It's how it works. It's how it fits into people's balance sheets, all those sorts of things. And we need to make sure that we think about those things. 
Um, so in the United States, we had exactly the same issue that came up. So in the, we started in about the 1880s, 1890s, during the Industrial Revolution. Um, if you saw the movie The Gangs of New York, um, all that bad housing, um, that housing drove uh, the beginning of health policy or housing policy in the US. And it wasn't by the housers. The public health community saw this poor housing as something that was particularly dangerous and uh, could promote the spread of, of infectious diseases. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and so they really pushed for there to be policies to deal with that housing. Um, so in Canada, you guys dealt with the housing faster than we did and started making changes. So by 1922, there was large slum clearance. In the US, we did not do as well. Um, but what I want to do first is just show you some of the conditions because they're not so good. Um, so here you can see some of the living conditions that we have. People crowded closely together, mixing of uses, wastewater is present uh, in many places. Um, there's a great book uh, by Jared Day uh, called Urban Castles where he describes some of the conditions that are documented in some of the public health uh, 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 reports of the day about particular buildings. Uh, these are pictures of, of buildings that people were actually living in, so this is not some sort of, of plant. Uh, you can see here the, the side of the house is actually gone, um, but there are people who are, who are actually still living in those homes. Uh, this, is, this is particularly interesting, I think, because the, the uh, picture on your left, um, that's the unit for the landlord. Um, so this is not just a condition for uh, the renters, but people who were supposed to be, and supposedly of means, uh, also are living in pretty bad uh, conditions. And this is uh, another description uh, that was of, of description of the plight of uh, a grocer and you know, how we really weren't doing too good in terms of uh, promoting uh, public health. And you can see why the public health people were concerned. Right? This, is, this is pretty straightforward. It's not, not rocket science. Um, bad things are going to happen if we continue to house people this way. All right, so we have all this uh, in the backdrop. Public health, the public health community actually eventually has the wherewithal to get policy to change. And so we start to see uh, this advocated, but in the United States, it wasn't until 1949, like quite some time later, that we saw the first major piece of federal legislation uh, around uh, housing policy. And if you, it's the National Housing Act of 1949, and um, the foundation of this act was the issues that were raised by public health people. Right, so we're, we're initially going to use a lot of money to clear out these slums, to eliminate the horrible housing conditions, uh, and then we're also going to start building public housing. And so this is really the beginning of large-scale uh, uh, investment by the federal government in the United States on housing policy. Before this, it did not exist. It was a local issue, and uh, it, was, it was deemed that way. Now, even with this passage, I, I do want to note that the, the, the crafting of this policy uh, was done in a way to really uh, put constraints on the extent to which the federal government could interact with the marketplace. All right, so there are limits on who was eligible to live in public housing. Uh, there are limits on the types of rents that could be used. And there were limits on um, how nice the housing could be. They did not want public housing to really be a competitor to the private market. And that, that affected our, our trajectory in terms of uh, how public housing played out in the US. You guys are probably are all familiar with the large public housing projects that basically they've all been torn down um, because they became super dysfunctional. In part, that was because the initial designs of public housing had lots of features and amenities in it um, that ultimately, when the housing was produced, were not included in the developments. So they became much rougher, harsher places than the initial designers had envisioned. And as often happens, and it still happens today in public housing, uh, resources to, uh, to promote uh, rehabilitation and, and upkeep of facilities uh, have not been forthcoming. So those, all those places have lagged behind in a pretty significant way. And I do want to just note that um, 
Dr. Hastings here in Toronto, um, his push was exactly the same as this act. So you might think about our National Housing Act as following Toronto's example. Title I and the slum clearance, Title III and building public housing, these are the things that Dr. Hastings uh, was pushing for. So this is not new stuff, right? And it's, it's fully appropriate, I think, that we are having this conversation given uh, some of the interest that he had in moving forward. All right, so I want to fast forward. We start building our housing. We do our stuff. Some things work, some things don't. In the context of advancing health policy, though, uh, it was actually quite interesting in that once we had a housing policy, we became housers first. So people didn't stop talking about sort of the health aspects of housing. It was much more, you know, I got to say, I got rents. I got to put people in this. I got lease up. How do, we, how do we do rules and all that kind of stuff? And so there were only a few uh, efforts um, that over the, over the next 20 to 30 years really focused on health. Uh, one of them um, was the reduction of the incidence of lead exposure for children. Uh, and uh, in the United States, we had tremendous uh, uh, success in reducing uh, the incidence of exposure for children. Uh, a second example is something that's called the Moving to Opportunity for Fair Housing discrimination, a, a, a Demonstration. Uh, which we, we all call MTO. So if you hear about the MTO experiment, that's what we're talking about. And the moving to opportunity uh, demonstration was really an experiment to try to see what would happen if we allowed voucher holders, people who are getting rental assistance, to live in neighborhoods that had better amenities. Right? So historically, if you had a voucher, the only units where you could use that voucher were in, in neighborhoods that didn't have good schools and had poor linkages to employment, all that kind of stuff. So it wasn't surprising that people with vouchers then didn't have uh, good job outcomes and didn't have high income. So this demonstration asked the question, what happens if we move people to better neighborhoods? Do we see those employment uh, and uh, job attachment outcomes change? 15 years in the demonstration, the answer was no. We didn't see any impact on employment. We didn't see any impact on wages. But what we did see impact on was health. Right? People were, uh, psych they, they were, had better mental health, they had less stress and depression, they had lower levels of obesity, they had lower incidence of asthma and diabetes. The health effects were significant and measurable. Uh, and this surprised everyone, uh, but in a good way. Now, I, w I do have to say, uh, the MTO experiment, the studies kept going, and 10 years later, so basically 25 years after the thing started, we are seeing employment and income effects, mainly for the children, not for the adults. So the ch when children live in better neighborhoods, their trajectory winds up being a positive when it comes to uh, income and employment. And it's significant. If you've heard of the work of Raj Chetty and others, he's a, he, he was at Harvard, now he's at Stanford, um, he, he documents uh, how much better uh, people's outcomes are uh, through the MTO experiment. So, so we, we got, I almost got a twofer. We got the health and we got the employment and income stuff. Um, so everyone should be happy. Now we just have to get people to fund it. Um, um, so, so, so that's what we have uh, moving forward. So then comes the issue of health and all policies. And uh, in the Obama administration, uh, we decided um, that we were going to embrace the notion of health and all policies. And I should say, sort of rediscover the notion, as it were, since policy started that way in, in, the, in the housing space. Um, and so the, the Obama administration established uh, a, a, a large infrastructure that was focused and designed to, uh, to make sure that all the different areas uh, where policies affect health you think about the social determinants of health, perhaps, um, have to get together and talk about what they're doing so that everybody knows what everyone else is doing and we can coordinate and get better outcomes. Um, so that's the uh, National Prevention Council. Uh, a strategy was established that talked about how all the different agencies were going to contribute to uh, the improvement of public health. And there was a fund that was set up that wasn't really well funded to try to promote uh, more activities and research and that sort of thing. Um, and, and since then, we've seen 
a lot of change in terms in the United States about how we have uh, shifted. So when we do demonstrations now at, at, at Department of Housing and Urban Development, we almost always now include metrics for health. We look for the health benefits to try to better understand them. Um, we, there's a broader recognition across the government that the, that the social determinants of health are, are important. So transportation people now understand that they are health agents. Education people understand they're health agents. Uh, and it, it does reshape how you think about policy and how you go about trying to achieve your mission, that the scope of your mission changes in a pretty fundamental way. Uh, and you know, I did mention that we had some budget issues, so I, I understand that Canadians follow American politics. So, um, so uh, you may know that we've had things like sequesters and all this stuff that doesn't allow agencies to spend any money. Um, because of these budget pressures, though, you know, one uh, silver line that's come out of it is that uh, agencies and advocates have had to become creative in trying to find partners and try to leverage the resources that they do have to build broader support for particular types of activities. And so I think that is, I mean, we need to do that anyway, but this created an urgency on that that uh, has been uh, quite useful. Okay, now this is the section that I'm gonna change. I was gonna go through a bunch of the policies. I'm not gonna do that, um, except to say, um, I like this slide, this is this one. So I'm not very good with technology, so when I do a slide and things fly in and it all sort of fits, <laughs> I get excited, right? So, so this, is a, um, this is a slide that really um, is a summary slide of what, I, of what we call in the administration housing as a platform. So when housing happens well, what are all the areas where we, where we see positive outcomes? So, and, and I would say this is a graphic, there is um, empirical evidence to support all of the relationships here, so people uh, do better in the job market, people do better in terms of their health, so the upper right-hand corner, uh, allowing seniors, for example, to be housed well, it reduces the incidence of falls and, and those sorts of issues. Um, we, have, uh, we know that children do better when their housing stable and in, in high-quality housing. Uh, we know that children stay out of prison when they're more when they're housed well. And on the, on the lower left, I guess that's your lower right, um, uh, this is a study I really like to, to use just to demonstrate that housing is a very powerful intervention. So there's a research done uh, by a team of researchers in, in San Francisco um, that asked the question, so what happens to people with HIV over a five year period? How many of them are still alive five years later? And so if you have 100 people and you don't do anything, 25 people are still alive five years later. In their research, all they did was give people with HIV a house, a shelter. Five years later, 95 people were still alive. Right, so the difference in terms of mortality and outcomes was, is striking just because people had stable roofing, stable housing to live in. So the notion of housing as, a, as an intervention that affects healthcare is, is critical and is quite, uh, quite clear. I would refer you to another colleague of mine. Her name is Megan Sandell. She's a professor at, at Harvard. Um, and she has become a tremendous advocate uh, for the notion that housing and health fit together pretty significantly. The phrase she uses is housing as a vaccine which is basically the same concept. Uh, you, you give people housing, they don't get sick, other thing, all those bad things don't happen. And you know, I'm not the expert in messaging, but I know that vaccine, housing as a vaccine will resonate with a different audience than housing as a platform. I know housing as a platform is not a great one, so, so we struggle with that all the time. But the, but the concept is the same, that we're really trying to, to see housing as a way to allow people to, uh, to do better. And just to accent this one more th point in time, and then I'll, I'll move on to, to barriers. You know, I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago, and uh, one person uh, said a phrase that I thought was quite interesting. And it was that housing eats first. Right, so if you, when you have your payments for a month, housing always is the first thing to get the, pay the, the payments. Right? And so if you're not housed well, if that's dysfunctional, um, then you don't have much money left for everything else. And so everything else is gonna break down. So, so I do think that it's a, it's a very uh, good way to think about it 
and it's a, it's a powerful thing. So I'm skipping all of these things. I did want to say one thing on this, this slide. Um, so what, one of the things we did in, uh, at the, in the Obama administration was we used competitions to build participation around concepts. Right, so this, is, uh, uh, this was a sustainability competition that was done with the Ashoka Changemakers and uh, a couple other foundations. $10,000 prize, right? 289 submissions worldwide, three winners. So just by putting out $10,000, um, you got the attention of a whole host of, of organizations and a whole, and this is worldwide, and a whole bunch of communities to start thinking about what their solution should look like and to start trying to identify innovations that, uh, that generate real lasting change and, and positive enduring benefits. And so that is something that I think we don't use nearly enough collectively, but it's a way to organize our thinking and really signal what priorities we should have uh, in terms of uh, trying to get policies uh, implemented. All right, and this is, this is another slide I like, um, but, but it really does emphasize the idea that in a world where you have budget constraints, you gotta go find the money. Right? You have to go and find organizations, institutions, and sectors that have resources, and then find ways to partner with them, convince them that it's in their interest to have that partnership moving forward. All right, so all that, I, think, I, I hope it's, been, it's clear that housing matters, um, and that public health would be better if we saw those investments. So then the question is, well, why don't we see these investments? And I want to point to, I think, I think I'll have time to talk about four different types of barriers to investments. Um, I only have slides for three of them, so I, I, I figured up, I thought of an additional one that was worth mentioning on the plane. So, um, so you just have to bear with me when we get to number four. Um, so barrier number one. The first barrier is that you know, the sectors really don't know each other. Um, the, Oh, I'm, I'm, see, this is technology, Let, make me do these things. All right, so, bar so barrier one is, is the sectors really don't know each other. Um, so today, you know, I've done a lot of, for my job as an assistant secretary, I did a lot of flying around the country talking to uh, community development folks, to healthcare, to healthcare folks, to housing folks. And I started asking the question, do you know who the public health people are in your jurisdiction? And the answer was almost always no. We have no idea who they are. Uh, and then I would ask, like, in one place I asked a simpler question, uh, which is, do you know what building they're in? And the answer was no. They had no, no idea what the building was. And so if, if we don't have a situation where, different, where the people from various communities know each other, uh, it's hard to imagine how effective collaboration is going to happen. And there are really two levels to this. The first level is just from a business perspective. If you're going to build a, a new program, a new initiative um, that is going to uh, bring together different programs and, and blend them, you actually have to know details about the programs. You have to know how they work. You have to know what their funding cycles are. You have to know what eligibility requirements are, what the rules are. And if you don't know those things, um, it's, it's hard to imagine how you're going to develop a program that's going to work. All right. Moreover, uh, if by knowing others from a business perspective, you have the opportunity to increase efficiencies of how the system works. So what we did in the Obama administration, we had a program that was a, a blend of, the, of HUD, the Justice Department, the Education Department, and Department of Health and Human Services. And we asked, so as part of that exercise, we asked the question, so do you know where your money is being deployed for all the agencies? And the answer, disturbingly, was no. Uh, but like, they had an idea, but they didn't really, really know. And so we, we, dr we tried to drill down and figure out sort of where the money was going. And it turned out money was going to the same neighborhoods in many instances. And so we would, and, but because we didn't know that, we would ask a program participant to fill out the same questionnaire information three times, four times for them to participate in these programs. So their time is not being well spent, but then our, our resources aren't being well spent by requiring this, building the software packages to do all this sort of stuff. There are ways to increase efficiency that come with the knowledge of the other programs and other things that are going on. And then we also have sort of the non-professional, the non-business non perspective 
Um, and you know, one thing that, that, that you will see, and heck, you all probably have done this at times, is you'll have a conversation with someone working in a totally different area, uh, and you know, the conversation goes place, and then you just come up with an idea. Right? And, and those informal, non-structured interactions can be ways to find innovative solutions to problems. But if you don't know the people, you're not going to have those relationships, so you're not going to have those conversations, you're not going to have those interactions. This is the type of innovation that Jane Jacobs talks about. Right? So, so when she talks about uh, the, the value and the richness of a city, she really emphasizes that the cities bring together people of varied backgrounds and varied industries, and those random in, in, interactions can translate into new innovations that create increasing returns. So I got, I, Jane Jacobs I like, I know you all, you all should know who she is, right? Everybody knows Jane Jacobs, all right. Uh, she, she lived not far from here, she was in the annex, right? So, um, so, so that's, that's very good. All right, the second barrier um, is around how we do our budgeting. So what is true is that, you know, as I've been talking, uh, non-health investments, in this case housing investments, can actually produce health benefits. But in most instances, the way we do our budgeting, the health benefits don't ever come back to the housing agency. Right? So if I produce $100 of savings for uh, the, the public health department, so they don't have to spend that, I don't get anything for that. Right? And so when we were at HUD, we actually tried to get uh, the Congress to give us credit when we did investments that helped other agencies. And they told us, no, uh, we don't allow that. And in, in particular, they said, the rules expressly forbid this. Right? So it's not that we, we just don't like it and we're not going to do it. You are not allowed to do it. Um, and so when we think about this, it really does set up a system where there's less incentive to do those sorts of investments. If you have competing uh, uh, priorities in your agency, and some have these spillovers that other people get benefits, and some have direct benefits, you're going to choose the direct benefits. Right? That's what you're going to do, unless you have some altruistic uh, perspective, and, and charity is not a business model in general. So we, we definitely need to find ways to overcome this if we want to move forward. A third barrier has to do with uh, governance structures. Um, and just as if in, that, in the last instance we were talking about budgeting across agencies, here I want to talk about the benefits going across jurisdictional lines. So it can be the, the case that uh, investments by one jurisdiction have benefits in another. Uh, in this case, in the case of housing, uh, many housing funds in the United States are, are distributed to a city, to a particular city. But public health is often managed at the county level. All right, and so what you have is a situation where city investments are going to create savings for the county. And we, we manage our county and city totally separate governance structures in most instances. All right, now in principle this can be managed, right? You, can, you could get the city people and the county people together. They can set up a deal that says every time we see, you know, t a dollar saved, uh, the county will keep 60 of it and the city gets 40 of it. Right? You make a contract and you kind of do that. Um, but there's a problem with this, and, and I want to show you the problem in the context of uh, an experience we had in California. So, um, and it's really, I, sh I should have titled this the, the Mitch Katz experience rather than the San Francisco experience. But Dr. Katz uh, was the director of public health in San Francisco, and he became a big advocate for doing supportive housing, investment in supportive housing, and was quite successful in, in having that happen. Um, and so the city of Los Angeles, the county of Los Angeles saw that success. LA has a big homelessness problem. And they said, let's get, the, let's get him to come down here and do the same thing. So he did come down and he tried the same thing, but he did not have the same amount of success. And one reason why is uh, illustrated by these two maps. So the map on the left is the map of San Francisco. And in San Francisco, you see there's only one line and that line denotes both the county and the city. So in, in San Francisco's case, the county and the city are exactly the same. And the, and the people who govern the county and the city are exactly the same. The county supervisors are the city council. And so in this instance, the same people are seeing the investment and the benefits, seeing the savings, and then can make adjustments on their own. 
the map on the, on the right is the map of Los Angeles County. And you see um, many, many names in there. Um, there are 88 cities in the county of Los Angeles. Uh, and Los Angeles is governed by five county supervisors. And the city council has t of Los Angeles has 12 representatives. And there's a mayor as well. All right, so contracting in San Francisco is pretty straightforward because people are contracting with themselves. They all see the same line item. Contracting in Los Angeles is difficult. We actually have two parties and their makeups shift over time. So through elections, people come in, they come out, and so there's never a guarantee that the next group of people that comes in will be willing to abide by the contract that we set up today. And we call that um, long-term commitment mechanisms, um, and without those long-term commitment mechanisms, no one will want to enter into a commitment today. All right, so we have these governance barriers, and, and this is not about the investments. It's not about the savings. It's really just about how we set up our governments. Right? It's, a, it's a totally, uh, I was going to say, I was, I'm going to say orthogonal, but uh, it's, it's um, totally unrelated to the actual actions or investments that are made. Uh, yet it can be deterministic uh, when we think about outcomes. Uh, a fourth barrier I want to talk about is uh, the barrier of uh, regulatory alignment. Right, so if we want to have uh, uh, or organizations and policy groups work together, at some point you actually need their regulations to align so that, so that there's one program that everyone abides by. But if you look at the policy space, what you see is that um, even though policies are ostensibly dealing with the same group, their definition of who's in that group can vary widely. So you think about the definition of youth, like who is a youth? Like who qualifies as a youth? Is it end of 17, 19, 21, 15? Uh, today I was talking with someone, they said we count youth up to 29. Um, and, and so when we looked at it, at it in the federal government US, I think there were like 17 different definitions of youth across the policies and programs. So if you're gonna have a coordinated pro policy or initiative, you gotta figure that out. You gotta have one definition. And getting to one definition can be quite difficult. See the same thing with income thresholds. So some programs apply uh, to people of incomes up to the median, area median. Some are at 80% of area median, some are 60 and some are 30. Right? If you're gonna have a program, you, at some point you need to have uh, real, uh, you got to get this down to one. And the, the, the uh, process to get something like this, get these, al these regulations aligned, can involve uh, huge uh, investments and uh, very significant difficulties. Um, you may have to change your existing regs. You may have to get legislation to change how certain policies are implemented. Right? So the, the, the hurdles can be uh, quite significant. All right. So, the last thing I wanted to do today is just try to end a little more optimistic um, by, by looking at some, some current efforts that are out there that are um, trying to, to change our, our, our infrastructure around the intersection of housing and health and really try to give us opportunities to overcome some of the barriers that I've just highlighted. All right, the first one I want to highlight, and, is, and, I, and I, want to, I should just caveat, I'm, a, I'm associated with all of these, right? so, so I actually know them fairly well. But I, I think they're, they're exciting and, and offer uh, potential. Now, the first is the Build Healthy Places Network. And this is uh, an organization that's, that has been initially funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Uh, and its mission is really to support collaboration uh, between the health and community development sectors. Uh, and, it's, and it really is doing this by creating a clearinghouse, an uh, online clearinghouse that everyone can access. So identifying who should be in this conversation and then saying, come look at our website and we'll have lots of information up there. And so the information includes things like case studies of successful efforts or successful projects or programs. It includes um, details about like, what is community development for, for health professionals who might not be familiar with the area, what kind of research has been done, um, what are some expert interviews that have happened out there, um, lots of different things to try to create a shared understanding of what the space currently is and is decidedly oriented toward action. 
to try to be on the ground, how do we, uh, to help people think about how they might actually do something rather than you know, thinking about something. All right, so that, that's one, one thing that I think is quite interesting, and you all should look at it. There's lots of neat stuff up there. A second uh, initiative I want to talk about is um, a roundtable on public population health improvement. Now, this is done by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. I've actually been serving on this roundtable, um, which would ordinarily be unlikely, um, given I'm not a doctor and um, I'm not even an engineer. So, anyway, um, but you know, one, one of the things that, that this roundtable was trying to do uh, was really uh, increase the link between primary care and public health. Um, but what they quickly realized was that if they really cared about public health, there were a whole host of other things going on that were impeding people's uh, progress toward health that were actually more important than their direct interaction with their primary care provider. And so they needed to reach out and engage those things. So I, that's what they, they called me and said, well, you talk about like, housing and community development and how that works. And we have other people talk about transportation and how that works. And so they started to build a, a, a repository of information um, that is publicly available. They have workshops that, that cover particular topics and they call in experts and they have uh, discussions, uh, framing papers and then a whole host of discussions around it. All of that stuff is online and, and you can see some of the topics have been around collaboration, around how we might uh, better communicate the issue for uh, the public, uh, what kind of research is out there, what kind of resources are available, and how do you garner resources to, to build an effective initiative. Um, this is a, something, and National Academies has resources to do these sorts of convenings. I, I'm very optimistic that it can also be um, quite effective in shaping outcomes. A third thing that I wanted to mention was uh, uh, an issue, or a regulation called the Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Regulation, or which we um, affectionately call AFFH. Um, so AFFH is one of the uh, mandates that came out of the Fair Housing Act directed at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. So there were two mandates. The first was that um, HUD needed to eliminate bad actors, get, get the illegal discrimination out. But then the second was really to promote good action so that everyone has real access to opportunity. Right, so, so you're not supposed to be satisfied with whatever the status quo is. If you see too much segregation, you see isolation, we should be using our public funds to reduce those. All right, and so we worked on uh, creating a new set of regulations around this to, uh, to try to uh, help communities have conversations about what's going on in their communities, who's vulnerable, who is not, who does not really have access to uh, opportunity, and think about well, what would access mean? So, so for communities that have not had a voice, like how would they conceive of gaining access and, and what things are important to them? And then ultimately building a, uh, a consensus strategy to try to accomplish this. Um, one of the, the flagship aspects of the AFFH regulation is, uh, is developed, they developed an online tool that provides data and it gives people really access to a whole host of data about what is happening uh, in their communities. So I'm showing a couple maps. This is Philadelphia uh, in Pennsylvania and this is a map that shows uh, the distribution of people by race. Now it's a color map and um, what you see is that um, the racial groups cluster, right? And so uh, we don't make any judgments, right? But this clustering suggests that there may be active discrimination in the marketplace. It could be that people are choosing the cluster. So, you know, there are enclaves um, that people choose to go to, but a lot of times people would like to go other places and don't have access to this. So a map like this would give you a clue that we need to explore this more deeply. And the important thing about having this be publicly available is that it allows you guys, the, the citizens, to demand that the city does this, even when the city doesn't want to do it. A city could see this map and say, oh, we're going to do other things. Uh, but because it's publicly available, it allows uh, anyone to get up and say, oh, no, I think this is something we need to understand better because I think there may be problems here. 
Uh, a nice thing, another nice thing is that it allows for overlays of data, so you can blend data together. So this is uh, a picture that, that blends the location of subsidized housing, overlays it on uh, the extent of uh, voucher presence in a neighborhood, that's the, 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 the black shading and the gray shading, and it over overlays it with uh, the racial demographics. So you can start to see if, you know, for example, we were talking about the MTO demonstration, whether the voucher holders are all in minority neighborhoods, high minority neighborhoods, or are they distributed across neighborhoods in a more even-handed way. Right? It allows you, this data tool allows you to ask questions. And one thing that we did in the AFFH regulation, which I thought was uh, quite important, was we actually d helped define what priority issues we, we wanted every community to think about. So one of the things we thought about was, uh, and em emphasized was, the presence of racially and ethnically concentrated areas of poverty, right, where you have racial concentration and poverty. And so through the tool and through the regulation, we got to direct communities to actually have to look at this. Right? And so in this picture, you see all the, the orange circles, I guess they're purple, um, they, d they demark areas where you have these, these um, locations of concentrated poverty. And we wanted communities to actually think about it, we wanted to talk about it, and think about what it meant. So the reason I talk about the AFFH uh, framework is because I think it provides an instructive uh, framework for how you might have a participatory process around issues of housing and health. Right? It allows us to articulate what goals we think are of highest priority with focus on particular things. It allows us to, uh, to uh, have data that allows people to level set. So you don't have meetings where certain people have far more information than others and can really sh shuttle a conversation to a particular place. It explicitly creates venues for um, dialogue and discussion. Um, you know, I've had lots of moderation here today, and we have great moderators in Toronto. I think um, just creating those venues can really allow us to have different kinds of conversations. The strategies that are emerge are consensus strategies um, that then are owned by everyone, and everyone has buy-in. Uh, and then ultimately, um, the way the structure is set up, it allows opportunities for ongoing evaluation. So, this is not a report that goes on a, t on a, on a shelf in a bookcase in someone's office. This is a living exercise uh, that is uh, particularly um, important. It's a gift that keeps on giving, as it were. All right, so I have a couple other ones, but I, I think I'm sort of at the end of my time. So I do want to, let me just do a, a quick summary and say, when we think about the intersection of housing and health and how we do effective collaboration, um, it's important to understand this is going to be multi-sectoral, it's going to be multidisciplinary, and it's going to require participation of parties from well across the, the spectrum. And I would note, you know, uh, the, the, uh, Domenico Kahlo was the one who contacted me. He's in the Office of Equity and Inclusion, right? And uh, what's really important in this is uh, this multi-sectoral engagement, um, it really must include voices of people who are the most affected, the ones who are most vulnerable, uh, because in many regards, they have the insights of what it really means to live under stress and in difficult conditions. And we can learn about what's most important in those contexts moving forward. Um, so let me stop there. Um, I'm really looking forward to the conversation, oh no, I need to say one other thing, which is this last point is important. We are already doing this in some sectors. So the homelessness area is an area where, where we do see a lot of collaboration across um, sectors. Um, but it's a, sadly one of the few areas where that's the case. And we need to get many more places engaged and involved um, so that we start to see uh, broad-based improvements in public health across the spectrum. So thank you very much, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Great, so thank you very much, Dr. Bostic, for your lecture and for sharing with us your experiences and expertise on housing and health. Um, you've certainly given us 
uh, quite a bit of food for thought, and I would argue a platform for action in order to establish an ambitious housing and health agenda for Toronto. By your own words, you may not be a doctor or an engineer, but I would argue that you are a public health champion. So thank you again. But folks, we have much more for you this evening. In fact, not only do we have Dr. Bostick's lecture, which you've just heard, but we also have with us two local leaders to offer their thoughts on Dr. Bostick's presentation and explore their implications for Toronto. But I have to tell you, you've now been sitting down for over an hour. Okay, this is not good for you. So I am actually going to suggest, I'm about to introduce your, your two local leaders here to give some remarks then we'll engage in a bit of a panel discussion. But I'm gonna ask you a favor. I'm gonna ask that once I introduce our speakers, then I'm, I'm gonna ask that you give them what we call standing applause, okay? One, it makes your speakers feel really good, and two, it's actually good for you. So let me start by introducing our first local leader who's here to join us. Dr. Stephen Gates is a leading international researcher on homelessness and is the director of the Canadian Observatory on Homelessness at York University. He focuses on conducting research and mobilizes knowledge to have greater impact on solutions to homelessness. Dr. Gates has played a leading international role in knowledge dissemination in the area of homelessness through the Homelessness Hub. So with that, I'll ask you to all stand and join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Gates. Thank you. Wow, a standing ovation. I'm, I'm feeling pretty special. You know, it's, it does work. Good, well, uh, thank you. Um, it, it's a, a pleasure to be here, a pleasure to hear your talk. And I think the, the, the topic is really important. Uh, the link between health, housing, well-being, uh, and the route to it, talking about systems integration, how do we work collaboratively to do this uh, is important as well. And I think one of the great examples of where we're failing in this regard is the fact that we have a homelessness crisis in Canada and the United States. You know, modern mass homelessness uh, emerged in the 1980s and 1990s and we've now become kind of comfortable with it. We have a big problem here in Toronto. And I think part of the problem is that we have failed to take a public health approach to the issue. Um, instead, we have taken a, a crisis response. So, uh, and let me use a, a story to give you an example of how truly crazy I think this is. So, in Kelowna, British Columbia, in 2003, there was a major forest fire that moved towards the city. And there were concerns, you know, about people living in those houses. So, they started to make emergency plans, that kind of thing. Finally, the fire hits the city. Houses start burning down. And so they had to evacuate 20, 23,000 people, right? You know, you have to leave right now. And so this being Canada, we uh, put people in hockey rinks and in gymnasiums and put them caught side by side by side, gave people bag lunches and, uh, you know, met their immediate needs. And now if we went back to Kelowna today, um, doing my math here, that's like 14 years later, and you went into a hockey rink and there were still people on cots, you'd say, wow, we really screwed that up. And I kind of feel that's what we've done with homelessness. We've mistaken the crisis response for how to address the problem. And the consequences of that are profound for individuals, for families, and communities. We know well from research that the longer someone endures homelessness, their mental health declines, their physical health declines, uh, there's nutritional vulnerability, there's greater uh, risk and reality of trauma, assault, criminal victimization, uh, earlier mortality. It, it's horrible what we're doing. In the city of Toronto, we have 4,500 shelter beds or something like that, right? Over 5,000 people. The numbers fluctuate minorly over the last 15 years. We're not making progress. 
And so this is a problem, right? And, and, and the longer I'm involved in this, the more unethical it seems, the more horrible it seems, you know? And Martin Luther, Dr. Martin Luther King once spoke about the fierce urgency of now, right? That there are some things we can wait for and some things we need to act on. And I feel that we're at that point with homelessness. We have to change what we're doing. And, oh, I better keep track of the time here. And uh, we've made some progress in Canada, some of the lessons we've learned from the United States. Housing first, right? So, so you know, in looking at what you can do about homelessness, you can prevent it. You can have your crisis response, and you're going to need that always because bad things are going to happen. But you also have to move people out of homelessness. And through housing first, we know there's a strong evidence base that it works if done well. Right, getting people out of homelessness, get them into housing with the supports they need without making the demand of being housing ready, having to prove that you are ready for housing. This is the most absurd concept ever, being ready for housing. You know, when a newborn baby is born, we don't sit and ask, you know, I'm not sure that baby is ready for housing because all they want to do all day is sleep and drink, you know. We assume that everybody is ready for housing and we have to get there. So we're getting better on, we've got our emergency system, and, it, and it's a very expensive system. It's a sector-based system, right? Uh, it, it is not one that's public health based. Uh, it, it rarely is integrated into other mainstream services. And we're working on housing first to get people out, but the thing we're not focusing on is prevention. Prevention. Why do we not focus on prevention? It's as if, you know, years ago we were looking at traffic deaths and we thought, should we mandate seat belts? No. Should we uh, focus on drunk driving? No. Let's make a better emergency department. Like we would all consider that absurd. We know from public health the importance of immunization. The evidence is overwhelming. Yet on this issue, Homelessness in Canada and the United States, I would argue, we've largely ignored it. Other countries have not. Australia, in the UK or in England now, where you've got the, the crazy Conservative Party, if I might call them that, focusing on Brexit, they just passed homelessness prevention legislation that mandates the kind of uh, interdepartmental collaboration that you're talking about, which is necessary. Right? And so we at the observatory just this past week released uh, a framework for homelessness prevention based on the public health model that argues not only must we change to prevention but how we might do it, create some common language. And if I can just briefly go over this, uh, some of the thinking and how it links to public health, um, I think we can make some progress in this country. We need a new direction and we need it now. The public health model of prevention involves three things, primary, secondary, tertiary. Um, so primary prevention means working upstream. Secondary prevention means, um, you know, before you working upstream before the problem starts. Secondary prevention means, uh, you know, addressing uh, a health issue when there is imminent risk or after something has happened to like nip it in the bud and tertiary prevention is if somebody's experienced a health condition, what can we do to stop it from recurring? And so well, how would, might we apply this to home, uh, homelessness and why might it change the way we work? I think if we take this model, it's gonna do many things. One of the things it's gonna do is it's gonna point fingers in different directions because there's other parts of government and society that produce homelessness and contribute to it and they're off the hook because we've created this very expensive homelessness sector. All right, and I'll give you some examples as I go. So what would primary prevention look like? Some of these things are obvious to many, right? Like obviously we have a lack of affordable housing in Canada, crisis level, anybody living in Toronto knows that. We need to look at income supports, you know, so we've had rising cost of housing at the same time for many Canadians, incomes have been declining, right? That's a bad mix. We need to address racism. If people can't get jobs or housing or education that they have a right to because of their experience of racism, that increases the risk of homelessness. We have to address our, our horrible colonial history of, uh, of uh, treatment of indigenous peoples 
We have to address transphobia and homophobia, because these are drivers of homelessness. So these are like big population-based things. We also have to fix the systems that create homelessness. We produce homelessness. We know, for instance, we just released a study recently, 50% of all homeless youth were in care, right? In Toronto, what we call, you know, um, CAS, right? And foster care or group homes, right? We're dumping people from child protection into homelessness. We don't do well with the transitions. So we have to fix that, and that's one of those jurisdictional things. It's like when you're age out at 18, here's your clothes and a shopping bag, happy birthday, right? That's not good enough. We have to create a system where we keep with people. Another system failure that's profound is the criminal justice system. So we discharge people into homelessness from prison, right? You're out of prison, here you go, here's a list of homeless shelters, off you go. That is public policy at its worst, because we know from research, if you discharge someone from prison into homelessness, the recidivism rate goes through the roof. So it's not a you know, get tough on crime policy, that's a production of crime policy. So these are things we do upstream. We also have to focus on those people who are at imminent risk of homelessness or who have recently become homeless. And there's lots of research, and if you talk to people who are homeless or have experienced homelessness, generally they can point to, it would have helped if such and such support was in place when I was in crisis. So we kind of know where to go and how to help people. Um, we need better um, tenant protection, evictions protection. Right, so this would be secondary. And then tertiary prevention, and I'm going to wrap up on this, is to focus on once people get out of homelessness, making sure they don't fall into homelessness again. And this, and this is where the public health piece is really key. It is not enough to just put someone in housing. If you house somebody, chuck the keys through the mailbox slot and run away, there will likely be there were very high possibility of becoming homeless. You have to treat people with dignity. We have to focus on health and well-being. We have to focus on social inclusion. We have to focus on employment and education, even if it's a longer-term goal, right? And so we have to do that wraparound thing that begins with dignity, that begins with the voice of people who, with lived experience, that that includes their choice and voice in what happens and what will work for them. And finally, a prevention-based approach must start with human rights, right? We have to recognize that everyone has the right to safe, suitable housing. If, as a society, we can take that approach, then the rest of this will follow. It's not acceptable anymore, it never was, but it, to me, we have to stop this, right? We, we can't, five years from now, be talking about 5,000 homeless people in the city, right? And we're all responsible for that. So. I know you kind of turn it around into a happy note with your talk. Um, my happy note is I think that the opportunity is great now. We have a federal government that's actually interested in, in, in prevention. We've got a province that is. We have a city that I think is going to move in that direction. Let's get public health approach on homelessness right now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gates. So don't forget standing applause for Jay Pitter. She needs to feel good too. It feels great when people give you standing ovations. So our next local leader is Jay Pitter. She's an author, placemaker, and public engagement professional who leads inclusive city building processes that address growing divides in urban centers. Most recently, she collaborated with West Bank Corporation to increase community engagement in the Honest Ed's redevelopment process consulted on Edmonton's New Heritage Plan, and co-edited an anthology called Subdivided, which explored inclusive city building. She focuses on establishing the resources and relationships required for co-creating more inclusive, safe, and vibrant cities. So with that, please join me in welcoming Jay Pitter. So when I show up, I rarely show up to be positive. <laughs> so just get prepared for that. Um, 
When I was thinking about uh, participating in this panel discussion with my esteemed colleagues and deeply uh, concerned community members, I asked myself a question which is centralized in my placemaking practice. And that question is, who's not here? And the answer was, as it often is, people with lived experience. And by this, I'm not talking about the presence, you know, talking about presence in terms of creative input or audience participation. These aspects are indeed lovely, heartwarming, and even important. But what I'm talking about is creating space for people with lived experience to be situated as true experts in meaning making and knowledge production processes. People like Brittany, a young woman whose family was at one time stifled by the stench of feces infused sewage water leaking into the basement of her social housing unit. People like Lori, a middle aged woman whose fight against developers and the government to remain in her home on desirable crown land has contributed to a mental health challenge and undiagnosed liver condition. People like Zena, a youth who suffered from depression and suicidal thoughts when her family kicked her out of her home for being a lesbian. People like my friends older sister, a girl caught up in the underage sex trade in the poorly designed and isolated low income community where I grew up, a girl who was murdered. I centralize these people in my work because these stories rarely influence city building and policy making processes. So I'm going to ask you to centralize them in your minds. And because housing is intimate in your hearts, as I share these three points with you. So first, we cannot speak about housing vulnerability or disparities without confronting our nation's founding story. And you touched upon this a little bit. And by that, I mean colonization and resulting intergenerational class divides. The act of colonization, land surveying, and settlement in Canada literally repositioned Indigenous peoples as being knowledge and land keepers to second class citizens housed on the outskirts of their own country. It's tragic but unsurprising that a 2016 census measuring poverty and municipalities shows that indigenous peoples are at an economic disadvantage in cities like Thunder Bay and St. Catharines and of course also Toronto. It's also unsurprising that this group is joined by other racialized people living with the intergenerational impact of colonization. My second point is this. The history of health and housing the poor isn't neutral. And so given that I grew up in social housing, I'm going to make this point. Um, while there are some legitimate concerns pertaining to health conditions in communities considered slums, I would respectfully but fiercely take issue with Dr. Hastings and urban designers of his time if I were around when they were clearing slums to address health issues. Cities have always been self-organized places. The other part of this narrative that we rarely hear is that people who lived in slums were the first folks to organize in cities. They created schools and places of worship. They were beacons of hope for newcomers. They were highly intelligent. They were not just poor people living in squander in slums and a risk to our collective public health. That story is incomplete and it is also fraught with considerable class bias. 
And so in the book Subdivided, an anthology which I co-edited and contributed to, I talk about the clearance of slums. I talk about the top-down paternalistic housing development scheme fraught with numerous issues, not only here but also in the US. And we borrowed the, the design approach actually from Europe. And it's failed miserably all over the world. And so, and actually, interestingly enough, the public health issues we were trying to address when we were helping the little people living in the slums, we've actually created greater public health issues, including mental health issues, physical health issues, safety issues, and a sense of isolation. Um, I also want to, because uh, I don't want to be repetitive, so I'm just going to uh, hit a couple of other points. Um, so the poorest people in this country are from racialized groups, indigenous and first generation immigrants. So again, people who lost their home on their land and people struggling to create home in a new land. That is not surprising. It's also important to note that in a moment when housing affordability is non-existent in the city, a report called Making Ends Meet found that there are 70,000 working poor people in Toronto and many of these and other individuals are parents of indigenous and culturally diverse children living beneath the poverty rate. And you've already talked about overrepresentation in the children's aid sec um, in, in sort of children, uh, children's aid. I won't uh, drill down into that but I will say that Toronto has been shamefully referred to as the child child poverty capital in this country. We also know that financial hardships, alienation due to racism, and a sense of not belonging also increases vulnerability to mental health issues. And mental health issues are in turn one of the key contributing factors to homelessness and unstable housing. This is truly a vicious, intergenerational and complicated cycle. I, I agree with my colleagues here that silos and a lack of co coordination are a large part um, of this issue. But I'd like to also hearken back to my first point. I believe that the key to unlocking opportunities is centering the voices, stories, and insights of people with lived experiences of housing vulnerabil vulnerability, voices like mine. I'm pretty exceptional, but I'm not unique. In my practice, when I go into communities, I meet people who are exceptional, resilient, and insightful every single day. And, you know, one of the reasons that we're not including their voices in meaningful ways is not just systemic. I believe that we hate poor people. I'm going to say it again. We hate poor people. We don't talk about classism enough, its implications and its stereotypes. Many people think that poor people are immoral, unintelligent, and unable to act on their own behalf. The ultimate benchmark of poverty is being unstably housed or worse, homeless. So I'm quite certain that class biases permeate traditional policy making processes in this country. In my practice and personal experiences, poor people and vulnerably housed people have proven themselves to be intelligent, resilient, and eager to play a meaningful role in making change. For instance, in addition to the tragedy I witnessed growing up in the social housing community, I also saw people in my community barter childcare services so they could attend night classes, people who ran hairdressing salons out of their tiny kitchens, and people who stretched a pot of stew to feed newcomer families. There is nothing more personal than housing and home. And so I challenge us to examine this issue using a big picture policy lens, a local neighborhood level lens, and a personal accountability lens for addressing our race and class biases so that we can take immediate action.
Thank you very much, Jay. Uh, you certainly have, uh, you know, put a, a very um, significant challenge in front of us, and I think of, I'm sure, have fostered or given us much food for thought. And now we're at the point in the evening where the opportunity is here for you to address or, or to pose questions of our panelists. Uh, you've heard a lot of very interesting facts, a little bit about lived experience, lots about research, both in the American and the Canadian context. So here is our opportunity for you to ask any questions you may have of the panelists. I believe I saw a microphone over there. And uh, folks, if there are any other uh, Toronto Public Health staff around, is this the only microphone that we have? Or are there others coming along? Perhaps what I can do while we're getting that going and while some of you might be formulating questions that you might have for these three esteemed guests that we have, I might just start off with some questions and here comes a microphone out here. So there will be a microphone just over here as well for those of you who might have questions. Let's start off with Dr. Bostic. Dr. Bostic, this morning you attended a meeting with leaders from various sectors from the housing, or from the housing and health sectors, excuse me. Can you give us a sense as to um, a little bit more in terms of the similarities between the U.S. and Canada in terms of challenges and possible solutions? So, um, they're the same. <laughs> you know, I, I think that um, the, the challenges around housing, so in the U.S., I do feel like we're still not convinced that housing is something that policy should really be present on at the federal or at the state level. So in the state of California, Jerry Brown has said repeatedly he doesn't know why anyone's talking about the state of California really doing much in housing. Now, we're trying to change his viewpoint on that, but, but there is um, a default position that people have, um, particularly in the policy space that, um, that many have, that, that housing is not really where we should be. Um, and what that's done, I think it's, it's, it's made it more difficult to uh, create housing as a focal point. Um, and th those focal points are really important in terms of getting policies, uh, policy discussions going. Now, we've had the same housing crisis that, that you guys have here. Um, and I do think that it's gotten sufficiently acute that we're starting to see movement. So in LA, in the last two elections, there have been uh, referenda to pass bonds to support the building of homeless uh, housing and to support the services to go in that housing. These were countywide votes and kind of unprecedented, but I think it's a, it's a sign that, um, that people are recognizing this more collectively. I also think that um, one thing that is, that is the same between Los Angeles and here is that you know, part of the reason why housing is expensive is because we don't have enough units. Um, and when you, when you have a shortage of units, um, you know, the simple supply and demand, I, I, I'm the economist, I always go back to that. Um, but if you have more people who want something than there are that thing available, there's gonna be an auction. And the people that have the most money will get the goods and the people that don't, won't. And a lot of what we're seeing here is um, because we have a shortage in LA, I think LA City, the shortage is like 70,000 units. Um, and so when you have that kind of shortage, there just aren't units available and pe the people at the low end of resources have to um, make choices, and those none of, but none of them are good. I did want to speak to some of your points uh, because I, I do think that, um, that there are some, some parts I very much agree with you on. Uh, but there are others that I think, um, I, I want to, I'll just say what I want to say. Um, <laughs> So, so I do think that when we think about slums, there were public health risks, right? and there were challenges. Um, but, that, but acknowledging that is not an endorsement of the solutions that get selected. And so in, in, in the US, we have a very bad history of taking, actually this is actually not even slums, taking functional poor minority neighborhoods and in the name of urban redevelopment uh, eliminating them to provide opportunities for more moneyed people and 
and people with, with different backgrounds. Right? And, and so I, I think that there needed to be a response to the issues around the public health problems. Um, I don't think that the solutions in many instances, the, the approach we took was not the only way we could have done it, and it led to a lot of cost. So I agree with that completely. I don't have any issues with that. Um, your, your statement about we hate us hating poor people, um, I think institutions don't respect poor people. And in the US, we, we have an ongoing discussion about whose fault it is that people are poor. If someone is poor, whose fault it is. Right? That, that's our discussion about trying to assign blame. And in the US, we're big on individual responsibility. So there's a, there are a lot of people who default to the notion that, um, that if you're poor, it's your fault because you didn't work hard enough and all that kind of stuff. And the, the truth is much more complicated. And oftentimes, um, that is not the right answer. So we have a podcast. It's like, I wasn't going to do it in my commercial, but I'll do it now. Um, <laughs> it's, we, do a, we do a monthly book club. And in the book club, um, we have covered a number of books that get at who's included and who's excluded. And how do we talk about classism? Do we talk about, like in the US, anytime someone talks about class, they get yelled out, it's class warfare, class warfare, you start to stop talking about that. But there's a book called White Trash, which is like this 400 year history of class in America. That from its very founding moments, um, there, were, there was class, um, and it was even among Europeans before you get to the slaves, right? And that's a whole nother type of class, right? And, and you are exactly right in that our narrative in our country whitewashes all of that. We act as if any person who ever got, got ahead got ahead only because of their hard work without recognizing that there was an infrastructure and a context for their introduction to the society, which made some things easier or more difficult for them. So I think that's exactly right. And I think that, that more talking about that is important uh, as we go forward. Um, my hope, though, and I'll just say this, the reason I talked about AFFH is because in that process, um, jurisdictions are I'm going to say it like this, and you can quibble with it, it's real, are required to try to reach out, no, required to engage every segment of their community and try to incorporate that feedback into a strategy. And, and my hope is that, and this is a hope because the reg is still relatively new, is that by having that real engagement and that real requirement for a consensus solution, that certain approaches that have been historically done will stop doing because they're not making a difference mm. and they're not changing the, the outcomes on the ground. Um, and it'll be our job as stewards of that process and of whatever process we're doing to make sure that we don't revert to the same old things that we've been doing for the past 60, 80, 100 years, uh, investing our resources in the same places, the same organizations, because we're going to get the same outcomes. And those outcomes are not about change. And so if we really want change, we really have to make sure that the inputs are different so that the outputs can be different. Here we go. I'm going to pick up on that point that you just made and ask a question of Ms. Pitter, who highlighted in her talk that we do have challenges with respect to meaningful community engagement. And I think you tried to, Dr. Bostic, talk about meaningful community engagement in the in your description of the AFFH program. Uh, Ms. Pitter, what advice would you have for us such that we might actually better engage with communities and to do so well? So I think that we would begin by listening more and firstly recognizing the value of neighborhood level innovation. So I, in my presentation, I spoke a little bit about the fact that I felt that it was important to tell a more complete slum story. So I agree with you that there were some public health issues in slums, but for us to have solutions that are more equity-based and responsible, we have to also acknowledge all of the assets of slums as well. And so for us to improve our engagement of people who are vulnerably housed, we have to first look at the ways in which 
people wake up every single day and address the gaps that governments and municipalities and NGOs are not addressing. I think we should be following their lead. I also think that in housing development processes, because I collaborate with developers and urban planners and architects, engagement is seen as a hoop that you have to jump through in order to get to the next stage of development. We need policies which make it mandatory to have rigorous, robust, and long-term engagement with, with residents. And after a housing development is built, because we generally stop at the ribbon cutting, we need to enact and implement social development plans because housing is not, as you know, just about bricks and mortar. It's about the life of a community and laying the foundation for people to be engaged. And I speak in these conversations quite a bit and one of the things that I just you know, really have to underscore is that we need to have people on these stages with lived experience. They need to be knowledge producers. I would never show up here to sing a song or dance a dance that is condescending, not rolling back on that. Okay, Dr. Gates, over to you. Okay. What would you say are the biggest barriers to preventing homelessness, particularly in Toronto? And how might Toronto Public Health, other city divisions, and in fact, members of the public, engage in addressing those barriers? Well, it's a change management issue where there's, there are barriers in different places. Some of them are uh, between different levels of government. Some of them have to do with um, you know, jurisdictions both at the municipal level and at higher levels of government, um, which some of the things you talked about where the, the savings go into somebody else's pocket and that becomes a disincentive to work collaboratively. Um, in Toronto, Toronto is an interesting case. Uh, I've said this, I say this and it, you know, people often get upset, but Toronto has not been the center of innovation around homelessness. I think one of the things we have to do in a city like Toronto is, at a certain level is get over ourselves and look at the places that do make progress, right? And there are places where we focus on prevention more, right? And we can do that. There's lots of good examples of how to do that, not just from elsewhere in Canada, but elsewhere in the world. I, I can give you two quick examples. Mm -hmm. in, in St. Catharines, there's a guy uh, named Mike Lethby who run, ran, runs a, a youth homelessness shelter called Raft. And they started with eight beds and then they had to expand to 16 and then they expanded to 24 and then eventually it was like, um, you know, they, the building couldn't be expanded anymore. So they're like jamming people in, turning people away. And so he came up with this idea which is very similar to what they do in Australia, which is he was like, you know, a lot of the young people who come and stay in St. Catharines in the shelter. They start in Fort Erie, right? And they couch surf. And then once that is exhausted, they wind up in Niagara Falls. And then eventually they wind up in St. Catharines. And when they arrive there, they're greeted by pimps and drug dealers who, uh, as he describes, have do a better job at outreach than he's able to. And so a lot of damage happens along the way, right? And we know that it's horrible. So he thought, well, what if we take some of our money and hire an outreach worker to go down to Fort Erie and the communities out there and work in the schools or in the community centers, get involved in the community, because the chances are, here's the thing for a young person who's experiencing those difficulties, there's very likely an adult in their life who knows something's wrong. And um, uh, like a teacher or a coach or an instructor or a neighbor, but people don't know what to do. And so you have the outreach worker go in there um, and, and case manage the young person in the family once they're identified and keep them in place where they have natural supports, right? They have friends, they have other adults in their life. That's much better. Keep them in the community until they leave based on you know, and, and so what he had happen is the shelter numbers started to drop, like quite drastically, to the point where they were averaging less than 10 people a night. 
And so one of the barriers of his board was like, well, that was a great idea. Now we're in financial crisis because we're paid on a per diem basis and the system like the system incentivized warehousing people. Right? So so you know there's there are examples like that in Canada, lots elsewhere in the world. There's lots of examples of how to do better transitions around people leaving care. Um, we need to look outside, we need political will, we need higher levels of government to support it, right? So we have to scale up and get that kind of alignment. As I said, the timing is really good. I think the government of Canada, when it reviews its homelessness strategy, is going to put prevention in there. But we've got to like make the changes here. And I'll, I'll give one last barrier. This is another thing that gets me in trouble, but you started this with like <laughs> calling out things to get people in trouble. But the, the <laughs> But the sector is part of the trouble, right? Because, I mean, people are very passionate about what they do. But often the call, what is needed, people ask for, is more of the same. We need more shelter beds. Now, we do have a crisis because there's so many homeless people. But I think our, our goal should be to, like, get people housed and stop them flowing into homelessness. Do what we can. And eventually we'll be closing shelter beds. You know, but that's, like... There's a lot of people that have responsibility for the change. And the good news is we know, I think, the idea, we don't have to like start from scratch. We kind of know what to do. There are other jurisdictions in Canada that have had much bigger success at reducing homelessness, most notably in Alberta, which often people go, Alberta, how could that be? They're all rednecks there. And, but I always remind people, the day that uh, Calgarians voted in Nahid Nenshi, we voted Rob Ford in, <laughs> right? So I'm not sure we really know where the rednecks are. But anyway, so we, I think we, there, is, there is hope. But we have, to, we have to, to, to be committed to changing things. So it's, it's leadership, but it's dispersed leadership. It's at, it's at every level, everywhere, from the community all the way to the federal government. Thank you for that. Well, so audience, as you can see, your panelists have provided you with no shortage in terms of food for thought. And you can see that our audience has responded to the call. I think we have some questions for our panelists. Okay. Hello. Thank you very much to the panelists for coming out tonight. I have two questions, if that's okay. One directed to Jay and one for Stephen. First, I'd like to really particularly point out Jay's comment around the fact that we hate the poor. I think it's really important for us today in this room to really confront our biases and our understanding and ideas around our relationship with the poor. So I really hope people sit with that comment. So thank you very much, Jay, for that. So my first question is for Stephen. I'm hoping that you can highlight the necessity for afford affordable housing within Toronto. So right now, the conversation is very polarized. It's either create more social housing units or help the middle class be able to buy a home. So I really want you to maybe really elaborate on why affordable housing, that particular subsect of housing, is so important. It, it absolutely is important. Um, the, 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 it's an issue of supply, right? If you look at the rental market, the problem is at the low end in terms of a lack of supply. And we created this problem. Like the affordable housing crisis, it's, it's interesting. It's one of those crises where we know exactly what happened, right? You know, like in the late 80s, early 90s, decisions were made to shift from direct investment in building uh, social housing in this country to letting the market drive the development of housing. So we went from building an average of about 20,000 units of new housing annually down to zero, and then switched over for incentives for home ownership and for the private sector. The idea being that that will be more efficient and the market will, you know, the invisible hand of the marketplace will create housing. Um, we did things like in Ontario, get rid of rent control for any build after 1991. A big irony now is when you hear that sector saying you can't put rent control in because it'll stop the building of rental housing. We saw rental housing crash, like in terms of new builds, over the last 25 years. Um, a lot of more building of condos, a lot more building of urban sprawl, but not a lot of low-income housing either for home ownership or um, 
rental housing. And so now we're in that situation. And so we have to get back in the business of a national housing strategy, of a provincial strategy that's robust, and one that also works at the city level. When we allocate dollars for affordable housing, we have to make sure they get spent there. One of the challenges for federal government is that if they unleash money into the system, at the provincial and the municipal level, sometimes there's sleight of hand where they'll take the money, like a, we'll take $200 million and then we'll cut our housing budget so it actually leads to no new investment. So we have to increase the supply. The marketplace is not going to supply the amount of affordable housing we need, so we're going to have to invest in social housing. The, the, the you know, disastrous models of, of building affordable housing, social housing, you know, we've learned a lot now, right? Like one could just, if you had the money, buy houses in neighborhoods, nobody would know it's social housing place them all over the city and you could increase you know th that kind of supply or, or build like there's lots of good ideas like we've learned a lot about how to build really quality types of housing that don't have to be big don't have to have a big front yard but ones that people can afford we need to think of the needs of young people in this country right like the percentage of young people in Canada who live with their parents the percentage between 20 and 29 who live with their parents is over 42 percent that's double what it was in the 80s and it's not because people are going, oh, I love living with mom and dad. I love when they ask me who I was out with last night. It's because they can't afford to go. They, they, the, the incomes have dropped, part-time, low-wage jobs, no affordable housing. So we have to get back in the business of it. Federal government signaled some things in that direction, uh, but we actually need uh, more investment. Um, we need to, to unleash the knowledge of how to do that better, right, to learn from the past. I mean, the worry is that we, we won't, but there are lots of good ideas about how to build uh, uh, social housing, affordable housing, and even private sector affordable housing. So if I could, I could jump in just for a second. I, when I talk about the affordable housing problem, theories, economic theory says it shouldn't matter what kind of housing you build. If you don't have enough units, it's going to be more expensive than it needs to be, and you just need to get more units in the marketplace. Um, but, but we actually have a short run problem and a long run problem. The long run problem is filling that gap. So if you know, the city is 50,000 units short, we're not going to fill 50,000 units in a year. Right? So, so yep. it's going to take some time to fill up that backlog. But in the inter inter intervening time, we got a lot of families that are struggling, that are, that are paying far too much for their housing right now. And so if we wait till the 50,000 unit, 50, units come in, if that's 10 years down the road, that's 10 years where all of those families have struggled, right? And so what we want to do is try to have, in my view, a both-and situation where, you, where you, you reserve some amount of the new housing that comes online such that the, burdens, the burden reduction is felt evenly across the, as much of the income distribution as possible. Because if you just build at the high end, the burden reduction happens there first, yep. and then it happens in other places later. And so, so the, I think the imperative or the, the justification for uh, having affordable housing as part of your fill the gap unit strategy is that we want lower income people to feel the burden reduction just like everybody else, and in the same proportions as everybody else. And that is an equitable approach to trying to solve the housing crisis. Thank if, you. if I could just add on that, just or one last point, mm -hmm. right? The, you're right, like we need to do that, but, but the, the, where developers build in, in Canada now is often suburban sprawl, large households on a, a, with a, you know, a big foyer, marble kitchen tops, that's the housing that gets built. We need different kind of housing stock built. But in a state of homelessness in Canada, we talked about the need to build more housing, so we need to work on the supply side. But we also have to address poverty. So one of the things we advocated for was a, a national housing benefit that worked like the child benefit. It works through the tax system. You don't need a bureaucracy in place. The money goes directly into your account to help relieve it. Because getting people into housing, and if they're still paying, you know, 50% of their income. That means something's got to give. As you said, the housing gets the first dollar, and, and what goes is things like food. I'm right. going to add two quick points. Um, the issue is not as narrow as stock. In Canada, a part of the issue is that we're allowing the housing bubble to continue 
because we actually need those proceeds to keep the country's economy afloat. And the second issue is that um, we have its aging infrastructure, and I believe that was mentioned here today as well. So we're saying that we're short on affordable housing stock, when in fact, just a week ago, it was announced that Toronto Community Housing was going to shutter yeah, actual that's true too. units displacing people rather than paying to bring those um, units up to code. So we are not necessarily short on physical housing units. I think we are short. Yeah. But, We're not as short like this. But, but it, it doesn't need to be, yeah. there are ways that you could not be as short. That's it, yeah, I agree. We have units so I'm gonna move on to our next question just to keep us moving. You Thank you so much, question. sorry, I don't, I don't mean to take up any more time, but my second question was oh, to Jay. Good. I wanted her to highlight more the concept of placemaking and having people at the forefront with lived experience. So a lot of the time we have people that are involved in this consultation process and they're very much tokenized. So I was hoping that you can elaborate on how do you meaningfully place people with these lived experiences at the front of the planning process? So I would just say very briefly that that requires some education. So obviously issues around housing development and policy development are actually quite um, complicated. And so you can't just parachute into a community and expect that vulnerable people can just like make meaningful contributions. And so you actually have to assign financial resources as well as time to do that education on the front end so that people can make meaningful contributions. You also want to do things like place people on advisory councils so that they can be peer mentored. They would bring something that was you know, meaningful to the conversation and the people sitting on those advisory councils would bring something. There would be an exchange of knowledge as well, so that's another strategy. Again, all of these strategies though require time and money. But they do really begin with education. I don't want to simplify what meaningful engagement looks like in all of my placemaking work. The foundation begins with explaining to people, you know, what housing development are, what are the key pillars, um, what a deputation is, what is the process where you can get involved. And so that education alone, like, requires considerable time. It's not short-term engagement. It really is long-term engagement, and it's a commitment. Thank you. So we have a question over here. Again, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation. This had to be closer. I'd like to start with a question to Dr. Kost, Dr. Bostic, but then ask the other panelists to comment. I'm really intrigued by the notion of the Los Angeles municipal uh, referendum on bonds for um, bonds for housing, because we don't have that kind of system in Canada where mm. electors can directly choose to vote or not vote for a particular initiative. So can you describe the a campaign, if you will, that was involved in that Los Angeles referendum, and particularly, did it involve, or how did it involve the people with lived experience? And then, to the other panelists, I'd ask if you could envision that kind of a campaign, that kind of discourse that happens in Los Angeles to perhaps inform the, the policy debates here in Canada. So, um, the Los Angeles situation is, Los Angeles is a crazy place when it comes to, <laughs> to all of these sorts of voting things. But, the, the, but um, there's a provision in the state that says um, you can't tax yourself, you can't increase the tax without there being a two-thirds vote of the public, right? And so this bond was going to be paid by a quarter cent increase to the sales tax, so it by rule had to go to public referendum. Um, so, that, that, so that was the structure, and it's, it's really a rule. So if you have any ideas that require raising more funds, you actually have to go to the public to, uh, to get that approval. Um, the campaign was actually quite interesting because it was multi-sector and, and multiple interest groups. So it was supported by the mayor, it was supported by the council, it was supported by labor, it was supported by housing communities, and it was supported by business and philanthropy. So each of them had their own campaigns to engage their own communities. Um, and so um, the, the labor movement in, in Los Angeles is actually quite powerful and quite influential. And they bring a lot of lived experiences to inform what policies make sense. Um, we have large immigrant communities that are facing the same sorts of struggles. And the community organizers um, for immigrant populations were out in the forefront. If you go online, you can actually see some of the pictures of the mayor and the coalition of leaders that joined in on this, in this engagement. 
and it's, it's quite compelling. And then uh, the third piece was a, a real effort to, uh, to make the evidence base uh, by, the by academics um, to try to engage um, in an accessible way so that people really understood the issue and that it was more than just a moral issue, that this was an issue that had significant stresses on our civic infrastructure to provide other health services. And so it, it actually had spillover effects that were hurting everyone. And so it was, it, it was a complex thing. And, 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 and the second one on the services is actually a harder lift because successive tax, successive votes to tax yourself um, you know, can, can always raise the concern that, you know, what are you, you're taxing me again? And so you're going back to the well twice in successive elections, I think was actually quite impressive. And that the coalition held was, was quite remarkable. So I would say that uh, working across uh, various groups, I think that would be helpful because right now we're having housing conversations in Toronto which are really very siloed. And so uh, developing the kind of collaboration and coalition that you're talking about, I think would be very important. One of the things though that I would say is that I don't like the idea of um, necessarily making a business case over a principled or a moral argument. I think that there's room for both. I know what you're saying about the 51%, but when we're talking about housing, we're at a moment right now where we're talking about housing as a luxury or a human right. And housing is indeed a human right. And I would go a step further and say this. That cities, if you look at the mandates or the mission statements of cities, they are not business case mandates. They are very um, principle-based, morally-based, aspirational mandates for what we want our cities to be. And so I think that we need to hold our municipal leaders um, to the fire because they are articulating a principle-based, an equity-based, a diversity-based vision for our cities and we should hold them to that. We shouldn't be forced into making an economic or an unyielding pragmatic case for people to have housing. Well this, well, this may be, I, I do have to say, this may be a difference between the United States and Canada. In the United States, housing is not a right, right? So we should just be clear on this. There's no obligation for governments in the United States to provide housing mm -hmm. to anyone. Right? And, and so to the extent that that is true, there is never a guarantee, there's never an explicit obligation or expectation that that must happen by the public sector. So to, to start in that space in the United States is a very difficult space to start because it's not a right. Housing is not a right. And you know, we might want it to be a right, uh, but to the extent it's not, it does put constraints on how you shape an argument to try to get real investment in this space. Stephen, did you want to get in on this? Yeah, one? I just want to, like that question of raising taxes is a good one. And I, I, I always say to people, please, you know, raise my taxes. Uh, in Canada, it's a tough problem how to deal with it. We don't have the, the referendum method and we have political leaders across all party lines who are, ter it's like the third rail, terrified, of talking about raising taxes, you know, like we want things, we want pharmacare, we want environmental protection, we want enhanced subway systems, even if they go nowhere, we want, <laughs> you know, we want affordable housing, we want all these things, and then it's like, well, we can do those things, but it'll cost more money, and it's like, what? Like, I thought it was free. It's like, no. So, I'm waiting. I mean, in the last election, it was interesting because we had, you know, Trudeau went as far to say, well, we'll run a deficit, which was also like a big... It's, it's ridiculous that these things are, are so controversial, but we're like so afraid of tax increases in Toronto. The idea of a toll road gets knocked down by the province. Um, in the city, we never want to raise taxes, property taxes above inflation. If we want a good society, a fair society, a healthy society, if we want good transportation, we're going to have to pay more for it, right? And not, the solution isn't somebody else has to pay more taxes, we're all going to have to. And 
I wish we could do that. Well, let's start with the top 2%. Let's start there. <laughs> well, it was certainly that, but it's also everyone else. I mean, we, we're, there's got to, we've got to, it, things cost money. Okay, folks, so. we have two more questions for the panel. Over to the right side of the room. Thank you. Um, I have a question um, directed to Jay. Um, I really appreciate the idea of seeing people as um, valuable in their contributions and um, as assets within um, social housing, for example. And I wondered how you could make the case um, to municipal leaders, for example, or um, um, yeah, just even um, others that um, people are assets and, th and that their informal contributions to the informal economy, for example, are a part of the housing and health um, um, discussion and, and part of the value. So I would just say very quickly, um, that's the reason that I work across all three sectors. So I work, you know, on a community level and institutionally and also with corporations as well. And I do so because I think it's really important to build bridges across all those three sectors. And that's also important in housing as well. We know that we're not going to develop better housing without private sector partnerships as well. And so it's really important to create pathways. So I don't think that I necessarily make the case. I design processes that bring people who are normally in sort of policy or academic spaces into um, community spaces, but managing those processes in a way that really address power imbalances. So you know that when you bring people with more power into community spaces, sometimes people feel as though they have to perform poverty or they're not mm. prepared to have a really meaningful um, conversation or to make a meaningful um, contribution. And so it's really designing processes that make the ground a little bit more even and also, because I'm trained in participatory research, um, one of the things that I'm, I'm trained to do is to look at uh, place-based narratives and stories and to both code, validate them, and come up with themes which directly impact design and policy as well. So that's a large part of my work also. And do we have one more question over there? Oh, another one over here, I'm sorry. So. We'll come Each back get half the question. Okay. Um, so this is most certainly because I actually went to USC and lived in LA. Yeah. Um, but so could you pull? Yeah. Uh, could, you, could you pull some kind of lessons learned and examples from LA Skid Row in in mm. terms of how to prevent that from occurring here in Toronto? I feel like it's we're developing this ripening condition for Skid Row to happen, especially because a lot of our homelessness initiatives are very seasonal. Like we have you know, out of the cold, things like that, but it ends in spring. So then, you know, those people that were receiving some kind of shelter in some sort, they're obviously lost within the system um, and with no linkages to get back on track. But anyways, um, yeah, so. So has, how many people here have been to Los Angeles? Oh. <laughs> and how many people have seen Skid Row? Yeah. See, that's, yeah. that's actually quite interesting. Um, so Skid Row is an area just on the east end of downtown in Los Angeles. And it is the place where most of the large homeless service providers are located. And so it's become the home for probably 80% of the region's homeless. And, no, that's probably too high. I don't know exactly what the percent is. It's, it's, it's a, say it's a lot of people. It's like a and, district of homeless. And so when you, when you, if you drive down to Skid Row, you just see lines and lines of mm -hmm. tents mm -hmm. and people walking around that are in very bad ways. Um, there's a lot of drugs there. There's a lot of um, abuse, violence, um, fear. It's a very difficult place. And because the services are not distributed more broadly, it's become the magnet. So people come there from all over uh, and basically swamp that neighborhood. So it's not safe for the homeless people. It's not safe for business to operate there. Um, and it's very difficult to see, um, to see how that transforms. There, there are two dynamics I want to talk about. So one is really, can we distribute services around so that one neighborhood is not bearing a disproportionate burden? Right, and, and so can we get people to see other parts of the city as a place where they might find refuge 
uh, and trying to accomplish that. And that has become very difficult. So uh, as many of you know, proposing a homeless services uh, uh, facility in a neighborhood that has not had it historically gets protested like pretty vigorously. So, so getting over that burden is, is particularly challenging. The other dynamic, which is, I think, exacerbated the, the Skid Row situation, is that downtown has started revitalizing. Yeah. And so the boundaries that define where Skid Row st starts are being squeezed. So Skid Row physically is becoming a, a smaller space, which is also contributing to an increased concentration of problem. And we have not, um, I, think, I think that's part of the reason that led to the desire to do this bond, um, to, to change this, the, the, the math about providing support for homeless, um, for homeless people. Uh, because, you know, it's sort of what you were talking about. In many regards, in many cities, the poor are invisible. Right, the poor are not noticed, they're not acknowledged, um, and you know, the system just goes on without them, without any thought of them. Right? They're, they're there and they contribute, but they're not really thought of. Uh, and when our skid row started to get squeezed, it was impossible to not notice, because the homeless were, it was, it was squeezed, so a lot of people who were in skid row didn't feel, felt, they weren't feeling safe before, they felt a whole lot safe, less safe, and then started moving to other parts of the city. And so we started to see homeless in other areas, and that made the problem much more visible to a, a much uh, wider segment of the population to acknowledge really the depth of what the problem was. But I don't have a lot of solutions. Um, I think that the, it'll be interesting to see how the, this new bond money gets deployed, and whether that then leads to sort of a reduction of the stress across these, these communities. Do you feel like there's anything based on, in terms of uh, taking kind of the surveillance and improving that approach? Like you showed an example of the mapping tool and, and those capabilities that we have now, but um, like to me everything is taking public health stances, evidence-based, you, you brought it up. It's, you know, in order to get money or to prove that something's working, you need to show evidence. How do you do that? It's showing numbers, surveillance. So. Um, are there any policies that kind of help improve that infrastructure? Or? Yeah, so no, I, I think that most of, okay, it's a blend. There's not much money being spent on prevention. Right? And I think that, that is, that's a problem. But I do think that the second uh, bond that promoted services is really on that back end to try to make sure that as people get into the housing, they're put on a trajectory that allows them to not return to homelessness. Yeah. So I think that back part has been, um, that's a really positive development, but the prevention side, we're silent on that. Yeah, the, the research on housing first, and there's a lot in the United States, a lot in Canada, it's pretty compelling that it works for most people. So that's the exiting. On the prevention side, the research is mostly from other countries rather than Canada and the United States, because we've been avoiding doing it. Um, but there is research, right? And so this is like promoting something. But check out on the Homeless Hub our prevention framework, because it reviews the literature on, on prevention of homelessness and it articulates a model for how we might do it, right? Um, and you have to do both. You have to help people exit the the people on Skid Row and you have, but it, it won't be enough to just help them exit because the flow in will continue. You have to stop the flow in as well. And that means not just housing, but housing stability, helping people retain their housing with dignity and safety and well-being. And so with that, I'm gonna give you the honor of the last question of the evening. Thank you very much. Um, it has been an insightful honor to listen to all four of you. Thank you. Uh, my question revolves around an issue which I'm sure you're familiar with, which those in the UK call cuckooing, or which the organization I work with calls housing unit takeovers, or mm. HUDs. Mm. For those unaware, a HUD is the occurrence, typically, of when a drug dealer takes over someone's dwelling for their own purposes. Usually, they offer free crack, and the rest is a downward spiral for the resident. I have questions for all three of you, if you don't mind. For the doctor, what preventive measures can we take? 
as you've said in your final statement, to create change, the input affects the output. Stephen, my question to you is how to prevent the criminalization of these victims who are mainly hardcore drug users. Most don't trust the cops, so what can we do to get the predators out when law enforcement is not a viable option? And Jay, if you can contribute any suggestions on solving this problem, I'm just interested in your insights on this topic. I'm just not sure what question to ask you as your worldview is avant-garde, but extremely practical, not to mention noble, and reflects the course we have taken. Thank you. So Stephen, you go first. Okay. Yeah, that's a that's tough one. <laughs> Joanna, I'm throwing it over to you. No, the, I think that's a really complex, sticky problem, and it's what happens when we let things deteriorate. People with lived experience of homelessness are much more likely to be victims of crime. Uh, their engagement with police is much more likely to be with them seen as the problem rather than as the victim. And so the, the level of distrust of police and the whole justice system is quite profound. And so that creates a problem. I think the solutions have to really come back to what you're talking about. Like we have, when people are socially excluded, marginalized, and come to so distrust public institutions that they'd rather do anything than engage, then we have to really think seriously about how to, how to do that. How to engage people in those situations, in coming up with solutions. Um, it's not going to be easy, right? Because crime is a slippery thing, right? If you know, um, heavy-handed law enforcement. I, I mean, you are talking about criminal activities, right? So we can't ignore the criminal justice system as part of it, but we can't just have it come in without a more collaborative approach. I, you know, this question really hits very close to home because. At the beginning, I spoke about the underage sex and drug trade mm -hmm. that emerged in my community. And in fact, the pimp and two of his colleagues took over the home of a single mother. And, um, and that home was used as a base for underage girls who were unstably housed or homeless. Um, so the sex trade was actually running out of the home and the exchange was in fact drugs and also some money for rent. Um, and then the pimp slash drug dealer in that situation became abusive to the mother and all of the um, girls uh, caught up in that particular situation. A couple of things that I would say is that it all goes back to a few things. I don't know that these are solutions, but I can highlight um, some of the intersection, intersecting um, issues at play in that kind of situation. So what you have is um, poorly designed communities. Um, so, uh, you know, you talked about Jane Jacobs a little bit. So no thresholds, no designated. So the, the park is behind a high rise building. There are a few eyes on the street. Um, you can't mm -hmm. really tell who your neighbors are, who outsiders are. So there's some design um, deficits in that way. The other thing is that it was a really isolated community. Many social housing communities were built without arteries um, into the rest of the city or good mm -hmm. transportation. So those communities become a world within the city. And so they don't trust outsiders. The other thing about those communities is that they're generally over and mispoliced. And so mm -hmm. when crime occurs in their communities, people don't call the police because they don't trust the police. And then also, a lot of those communities are especially vulnerable because they're primarily, uh, they're, the, the primary population is women and children. And so those women and children uh, become targets to criminals like drug dealers and you know, pimps. And so it's a very complicated uh, situation. And I, I don't actually have solutions. I'm not yeah. that intelligent. But what I would say, though, is that I think that if we could get into the complexity of the issue, that would be the beginning to understand how gender is at play, how class is at play, how region and isolation is at play, how design is at play, how policing and safety is at play. And also, I just want to say this, how internalized classism is at play. One of the things that I realized, and I'm going to be very short, so Dr. Bossett can have a chance to weigh in. Um, one, of, one of the things um, that, as I, you know, when I went back into that community, one of the things that I reflected on, and something that really, um, I'm pretty tough, you probably have noticed that uh, this evening, but something 
that really broke my heart was, you know, as I was walking through the community, one of the things uh, that I realized is that, is that a lot of my neighbors and the people who lived um, in the community, uh, that they had internalized a lot of class and racism. Mm -hmm. So um, there, people d didn't protect their children and a lot of people didn't protect themselves because they didn't see themselves as being valuable. Um, so that's difficult. And um, it, it's the, the cumulative effect of distress and desperation. Um, and that's part, part of why we're here, right? That this is a problem that is not just a housing problem. Yeah. It winds up mm -hmm. being a problem for everyone else because housing doesn't work. And, and that is um, you know, something for all of us to take away, that building these connections is something that is, it, these are life and death issues. Um, and they're, they may be housing related, but they're, every other sector should care about this. So yes. this, this policing issue, um, you know, we care about public safety. There are ways to police every community, um, but every community should not be policed the same way. And so um, there are approaches that have been taken um, to more effectively police uh, public housing areas, uh, lower income areas, minority areas. Um, there are a couple of books that, that we've done in the podcast that have been really interesting. So one was about stop and frisk, um, it's called Enforcing Order, which just started in France. And how police were selected and deployed to various neighborhoods contributed to lack of trust. Mm -hmm. um, there's another book we, look, we, we read called Cop in the Hood about policing in Baltimore. Uh, and it, it documents what happened when policing went from the street beat to everyone sitting in a car. Yeah. Right? You, you, you stop having interpersonal relationships that way. You don't know who people are, and now everything is just sort of, you start relying on the MO of the neighborhood. You, you project that onto every person you see, and you don't make dis distinctions. The distinctions that exist in every neighborhood. Um, the other thing that was really interesting in that book was that um, all police, and for this is too strong, so I'm just gonna say it's too strong to start, but almost all police enforcement is discretionary, right? There are, so we all live this, you drive on the freeway, you're, you're breaking the law if you go over the speed limit. Every car going over the speed limit does not get stopped, right? The police make decisions. And this happens in every, in virtually every case except for murder and assault, right? Those, you pretty much have to do what you do. But everything else is discretionary. And how you apply discretion uh, is a function of who you are, your background, your beliefs, your biases, all those sorts of things. Uh, and we do not do a good job of training the police to be sensitive to that, so that when they're applying discretion, they see the context in a, in a richer way that has fewer enduring um, negative impacts about sort of the ongoing relationships. Because these are repeated I'm going to say it's an economy, like an economist. But these are repeated games. The same police see the same people day after day after day, and they learn a way to engage with each other. And that, that engagement can either be a healthy engagement or it can be a horrible engagement. And the question is what kind of training and guidance and ongoing support do we give to try to minimize the negative and maximize the positive so that these sorts of horrible abuses happen far less often than they do today. So with that, Dr. Bostick, Ms. Pitter, Dr. Gates, you have each, and together, given us lots of important messages to take away uh, on housing and clearly on other important issues that impact on the health and well-being of those who live in this city. And in fact, you're already giving me some thoughts about how we might uh, and in what directions we might take uh, Hastings lectures uh, for years to come yet. 
But with that, I think it's my responsibility at this stage of the game uh, to bring us this 2017 Charles Hastings Lecture on Public Health to a conclusion. Uh, before I do that, though, I would like to again thank you know, our three panelists, and I'd ask that you join me in thanking our three panelists. One, not only for, for, for participating in this important conversation, but also for raising the level of conversation. So, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you, Bob. That's right. <laughs> And while time limitations bring this formal part of the dialogue to a close, I would encourage you to join us uh, for a reception in the theater lobby. We can continue some more informal dialogue there. But before I send you on your way, I should thank our event sponsors once again, Evergreen City Works, Public Health Ontario, and the Centre for Urban Health Solutions at St. Michael's Hospital. Thank you again, all of you, for joining us, and I wish you a good evening. <laughs>